when we show the world that we're not what they say about us, that we're not white colonizers, that we're actually an indigenous tribe of people that was kicked out of their homeland and spread throughout the diaspora for 2,000 years, they can try to argue with that. But at the end of the day, the facts are on our side. The world has overlooked an important episode in modern history, the 800,000 Jews who left or were driven from their homes in the Middle East and North Africa in the mid-20th century. Welcome to the second season of The Forgotten Exodus, brought to you by American Jewish Committee. This series explores that pivotal moment in history and the little-known Jewish heritage of Iran and Arab nations. As Jews around the world confront violent anti-Semitism and Israelis face daily attacks by terrorists on multiple fronts, our second season explores how Jews have lived throughout the region for generations, despite hardship, hostility, and hatred, then sought safety and new possibilities in their ancestral homeland. I'm your host, Manya Brashir Pashman. Join us as we explore untold family histories and personal stories of courage, perseverance, and resilience from this transformative period of history for the Jewish people and the Middle East. The world has ignored these voices. We will not. This is the Forgotten Exodus. There has been moving and frankly overwhelming feedback from listeners of our second season, especially last week's live interview with digital influencer Adiel Cohen about his family's journey from Yemen. If you didn't listen last week, be sure to go back and tune in. Then you'll know why there's been such a demand to release the second part of that interview, a question and answer session. Why are we sharing this? It's a sampling of the conversations these episodes have generated in homes across the nation and around the world, inspired by this series. What will you ask our guests? Here's what a handful asked Adiel when he joined us at AJC Global Forum 2024 in Washington, D.C. Today's episode, Leaving Yemen, Part 2. Thank you for this conversation, Adiel. But now I'd like to turn to our audience and give them an opportunity to ask what's on their minds. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Someone will bring you a microphone. Be sure to state your name, where you're from, and keeping with the spirit of the event, tell us where your family is from, going back generations. Hi, thank you for coming. My name is Carol Weintraub. I'm from Philadelphia. And depending on the week, my family was either from Poland, Ukraine, or Russia. The borders changed all the time. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> take your pick. My question's kind of a fun question. You mentioned some dishes that your grandmom would make. You gave us the names, but I never heard of them. And could you describe them? Yes. So the main food that we eat, I would say it's like the equivalent to matzo bowl soup. That's like the default dish for holidays, for day to day. It's Yemenite soup. It's just called Yemenite soup. It's very uh, uh, simple. It's a soup made with a lot of spices, kurkum and hel. It can be a vegetable, chicken, or beef based with a side of either potato or pumpkin inside the soup. It's very good, very healthy. We eat it, especially in winter, every Shabbat. Like it cleans your entire system, all the spices. Some breads that we have that are also very common. Lachuch. Lachuch is, uh, or lachuch, you know, in the Yemenite pronunciation. It's a flat bread similar to pancake. It's kind of like a pancake, only fried on one side with holes. Yeah. And the other side, the top side becomes full of bubbles that turn into holes. So it's fluffy. It's like very, very soft, very good to eat with dips or with soup. We also have salouf, which is just a regular pita. It's a flat bread. Zalabye, which is kind of like the... In Yemen, they used to eat it during Shavuot. In Israel, now we eat it a lot in Hanukkah because it's fried. It's kind of like a flat bread donut. I don't know how else to explain it, right? It's kind of like sufganya, but made flat, like a pita. There's so much more. Wow, I'm starting to salivate here. <laughs> if you don't mind me just interjecting with one of my own questions, and that is... Do you encourage people to make these recipes to try out different parts of your culture, or do you feel a little bit of, or maybe fear, appropriation 
of your culture? Like, what is... is no, not at okay. all. Go look up Yemenite soup recipe on Google. It's all there in English. And it's delicious. It's healthy. Do it, really. Do you try other Jewish cultures, in fact? Kube must be one of my favorite foods that is not Yemenite. Okay. It's Iraqi Jewish. My hometown, Ramat Gan, is the capital of Iraqi Jews in Israel. Every time I say that I'm from Ramat Gan, people ask me, oh, you're Iraqi. I'm like, no, no, I'm Yemenite. So Kube, Sabih. Sabih, that's the best food I think Israel has to offer. Also Iraqi Jewish. I feel bad that I don't have anything good to say about Ashkenazi foods. I tried matzo ball soup for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. My sister, she married an Ashkenazi Jew from Mansi. Can't get any more Ashkenazi than that. And this was actually my first time trying and getting a taste of Ashkenazi culture and cuisine. Can't say that it like blew me off. <laughs> All right. Next question. Hi, Adiel. My name is Amy Albertson. I personally am from California. and My family is from Russia, Poland, and China. And my question for you is... As a fellow social media creator, especially during times like this, I get asked a lot about racism in Israel, since Americans are obsessed with racism. And they always want to point out how the Temanim, the Yemenites, the Ethiopians, the other, what Americans like to say, not white Jews are discriminated against and have been discriminated against since the establishment of Israel. Obviously, we can't deny that there is racism. Um, however, I would like to know your perspective, obviously, as a Yemenite Jew living in Israel, and also the good and the bad, where you find that things are hopefully better than they were in the past in Israel, and also where you think that Israeli society still has to improve when it comes to things like this. So part of the cultural discourse in Israel, we always make fun of how every wave of Aliyah from every place in the world that Israel experienced, the last wave of Aliyah discriminates against them or makes fun of them because, oh, the new ones. And in a sense, it is, it is true. You see it a lot. And racism, unfortunately, exists in Israel, in Israeli society, just like in every society in the world. I think that if you compare it to how it was in the 50s, we're way better off now. And racism is widely condemned all throughout Israeli society, against anyone, against any uh, communities. We still have the stereotypes. We still have, you know, these jokes that sometimes are funny, sometimes are less funny about different communities. I would say for the most part, we know how to maintain a healthy humor of kind of making fun of each other as different communities, but also making it all part of what it means to be Israeli. When my grandparents came to Israel, they were discriminated against. They were othered by the rest of society that was mostly dominated by secular Ashkenazim. The same thing can also be said on Holocaust survivors that first arrived in Israel and also faced discrimination from their brothers and sisters who are also Ashkenazim. So I don't know if racism is the right word. I don't think there's a word that can describe this dynamic that we have between our communities. But yeah, I definitely can say that Throughout the generations, it's become way better. We see way more diverse representation in Israeli media, in Israeli pop culture. If you look at what's Israeli pop culture, it's majority Mizrahi and a lot of Yemenites, if I may add, because, you know, we know how to sing. Not me, though, <laughs> unfortunately. But yeah, we see a lot more representation. I believe we're on the right path to become more united and to bridge between our differences and different communities. Hi, I'm Allison Platt. I live in Chicago by way of Northern California. My family is from all over Europe and then about 1,500 years before that, Southern Italy. So I lost my grandmother last week. So I'm I sorry. really thank you. I really appreciate the importance of telling our grandparents' stories. So thank you for sharing yours with us. For those of us who are millennials or Gen Z, who are, for better or worse, very online, Storytelling is important and telling our own personal Jewish stories, very important. Telling our collective Jewish story, very important. So for someone who does that on social media, what is your advice for those of us who are really trying to educate both on a one-to-one -one level and then communally about our Jewish identities? What has been successful for you? What has been challenging? And where do you see that going? So 
you know, telling a story, you can tell a story with words. You can also tell a story with visuals. Uh, some of the most successful videos that I made about Yemenite Jews uh, involved my grandma cooking and my mom cooking, uh, uh, making lachur and showing the seder, the, the table, how beautiful and colorful it is. So don't be afraid to pull up your phone and just show it when you see it. And in terms of verbal stories, speak to your grandparents as much as you can. When my grandma passed away, I realized how it can happen like that. And then that's it. And there's no more stories from Safta around Shabbat table. And what you manage to gather, that's what you're carrying on to the future. So collect as many stories as possible from every generation so that these stories can live on and exist. And just tell them on social media, open your camera, tell it to the world, because this is how they get to know us. Hi, everyone. I'm Yoel from Italy. I'm the vice president of the Italian Union of Young Jews. And part of my family comes from Egypt, so I relate to your storytelling. Recently, I have attended the inaugural seminar of Akran Europe. It's an organization who's fostering a heritage towards Europe. And we were wondering how to share our stories. So I want to ask you, what is the best thing for you to make the, the story of the silent exodus known in the Western society and especially in our university? And how do you think your activism is contributing to fight anti-Semitism? I think it's as simple as just taking the leap and start telling these stories. As I said, sit with your grandparents, with your parents, and just talk about it. Write down notes and turn it into a story that can be told through social media. Make videos about it. You know, Egyptian jewelry, if, if you look into it, there's so much there. There's the Geniza, right? The Cairo Geniza. So much knowledge and, and Jewish history not only from Egypt, but from the entire Middle East. You got accounts in the Cairo Gniza about how Jews lived in Israel, in the land of Israel, under Muslim rule. Stories that are not heard. When you expose the world and people on campus to these stories, first of all, you burst the little bubble that says Jews poofed in Israel in 1948, and up until then they didn't exist there. And second of all, you show them that Jews existed not just in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, in Egypt and in the Middle East as well. Your question was, how does my activism contribute? I hope to inspire more young Jews, Gen Z, millennials to share their stories and get connected to them and understand the importance of sharing stories because you can enjoy listening to your grandparents' stories, but then do nothing about it. So I hope that my content and then my activism inspires other Jews to speak up, just like I am inspired by other creators who also tell their stories. And I think Thank the you. other aspect of his question was about fighting anti-Semitism, whether or not you feel that sharing these stories helps in that effort. Definitely. Again, when we show the world that we're not what they say about us, that we're not white colonizers, that we're actually an indigenous tribe of people that was kicked out of their homeland and spread throughout the diaspora for 2,000 years, they can try to argue with that. But at the end of the day, the facts are on our side. And also the importance of a story. You can't argue with a story. If you're telling a story from your family, from your own personal experience, the only argument I can think about to put against the story is you're lying. And your lying is not a good argument. If they accuse you of lying when you tell your family story, they lost. Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm American-Israeli and my family background is I'm half Lithuanian and half Yemenite. I, first, yeah, hi. I just want to say I, I feel very and thoroughly inspired by you and thank you so much for coming thank today. You. As a child, I was fortunate enough to hear stories from my grandparents and my great-grandfather about their lives in Yemen. Recently, I read Maimonides' letter to Yemen, and I was particularly inspired by the fact Beautiful. that it was, it was originally written in Arabic and it was translated into Hebrew so that it could be properly disseminated in the community. It remains my favorite primary source regarding Yemen's Jewish community, but with 3,000 years of history, almost, there's plenty to choose from. So what's your favorite text or book relating to Yemen's Jewish community? That. <laughs> Igeret, Igeret Eman, the letter of Maimonides to the Yemenite Jewish community, is a transformative letter. 
It came in a time that was very, very tough for the Yemenite Jewish community. It was a time of false messiahs that started popping out of nowhere in Yemen, both in the Muslim community, but also in the Jewish community. And a false messiah that pops out of nowhere creates civil unrest. It sounds a little weird and outwardly in the world that we live in now, but when someone pops out of nowhere and says, I'm the messiah, I'm coming to save you all, And back at the time, it was revolutionary. And there was a lot of troubles that the Jews faced at the time. Because of the false messiahs, the Yemeni leadership was very hostile to Jews, just like every time there's uh, problems in society, who gets blamed? The Jews, for different reasons. And that time was the reason that Jews were blamed. That was the reason Jews were blamed for. And out of Egypt, Rambam comes. He did not set foot in his life in Yemen. But the head of the Yemenite Jewish community sent him a letter all the way to Egypt. He was in Egypt at the time after migrating all the way from Spain to Morocco to Egypt, asking him for help. And he sent him this letter. Rambam sent him back this letter, Igeret Teman, where he basically empowers and strengthens the Jewish community, telling them to maintain their faith and do not fall for the false messiahs and keep their faith in Hashem and they will be saved. It was as simple as that to save the Jewish community who was suffering at the time. And ever since then, Jews adopted, not fully, but adopted a lot of the Rambam's Mishnah, his ideas. And till this day, the Rambam is the most notable figure that Yemenite Jews look up to. He did not set foot in Yemen one time. The Jews did not go to Egypt and sought for help. But it shows you why it's my favorite text in our history. It's because it shows that even in the diaspora, even when you know, we were seemingly disconnected, we always relied on each other. And it's amazing to think about it, how a letter got to Egypt, sent back, and he saved a community from all the way far over there. So yeah, that's the answer. So I think we are out of time. Thank you for all those thoughtful questions. That was was really wonderful. And thank you for being such a lovely audience. And thank you, Adiel, for uh, you. joining us and sharing your family story and hopefully inspiring some of us to do the same. So I thank you. So. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yemenite Jews are just one of the many Jewish communities who in the last century left Arab countries to forge new lives for themselves and future generations. Join us next week as we share another untold story of the forgotten exodus. Many thanks to Adiel for sharing his story. Too many times during my reporting, I encountered children and grandchildren who didn't have the answers to my questions because they'd never asked. That's why one of the goals of this project is to encourage you to ask those questions. Find your stories. Atara Lakritz is our producer. TK Broderick is our sound engineer. Special thanks to John Schweitzer, Nicole Mazur, Sean Savage, and Madeline Stern, and so many of our colleagues, too many to name really, for making this series possible. You can subscribe to The Forgotten Exodus on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can learn more at ajc.org slash The Forgotten Exodus. The views and opinions of our guests don't necessarily reflect the positions of AJC. You can reach us at the Forgotten Exodus at AJC.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to spread the word and hop onto Apple Podcasts or Spotify to rate us and write a review to help more listeners find us.